Welcome back to the Cult House Podcast. I am your host, the scholar of spite and the Saturday Night Delight, Roger Riddell. Joining me today, he is the guitarist and vocalist for Colorado black metal frontiersman, Wayfarer. He is Shane McCarthy. How are you doing today, Shane? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for uh, having me on. Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I've been excited about this for a few days now because I was only recently introduced to Wayfarer, but I really like the sort of combination of uh black metal with like the western twang kind of thing that y'all have going on awesome man yeah glad you dig it so it's uh something that's important to us to do you know yeah yeah and you all have a new album american gothic coming out on profound lore on october 27th uh, i've had a chance to listen to some of the tracks and uh, i really dig it so far too Sick, man. Really glad to hear. And uh, yeah, just stoked to uh, finally get it out. Yeah. And, uh, so what all kind of uh, went into developing your all sound? I know that there's, you know, kind of a little bit of a Colorado sound uh, that, that kind of falls in line with that. Uh, but, you know, what what inspired the blending of this sort of black metal sound with like, americana and like americana in the folk sense and not the 1998 offspring album sense um yeah yeah there's not too much uh not too much <laughs> offspring on there uh, yeah it's 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 been like a a long a long kind of developing thing um i think the colorado music stuff that you mentioned um definitely played a big factor in it because while we all grew up being you know big metalheads and, and really into heavy music. Um, we were also into other things and, and in Colorado and Denver specifically, there's like this history of these kind of Gothic country bands, like your 16 horsepower, Slim Testas Auto Club, uh, Munley and the Lee Lewis Harlots and all those kind of bands around there um, that we were into and, and kind of looked up to. And I think eventually, um, you know, while the band more started, more strictly as a metal band, the, that influence kind of started to come through subconsciously. And then somewhere along the way, uh, you know, we recognize that and we're like, we should just embrace this and like, um, you know, kind of adapt this into our sound and like do our attempt at kind of carrying a torch forward of, of that sort of approach, but through our own kind of heavier music. Um, and from there, it's just been about, you know, dialing it in and making sure that it's never like a, a stupid kind of gimmicky approach to it and more like making sure that both elements of the sound are making making the same thing working together towards the same goal at all the same time um and yeah the last few records i think we've you know found our sound and found kind of what we wanted to do and be and uh we've just kind of pointed that in different directions for each record yeah, and uh, you know what you were saying about making sure that's not too gimmicky. I know that you know when you have something that's like, oh, we have you know this kind of a, a Western twang kind of uh, introduced to our metal. There's the fine line there where you cross it and you become gimmicky, especially when you're mixing in folk, you know, uh, elements. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Um, you know, and like some bands do that, and and more power to them. Like you know, just kind of approaching it as like a fun sort of um you know whatever the reasons that may drive it drive them to do that but for us it's just like um you know it's there, there's a lot of great history in that sort of music and that sort of sound that ties to here and i think it lends really well to like darker music um especially like you can see through all those denver sound bands like there is this kind of underlying darkness to a lot of it that is unlike any other type of music. And so to us, it just made sense to like play it straight. And um, like I said, kind of make sure that the the heavy parts were drawing from that well, just as much as the less heavy parts. Um, and yeah, that's always been kind of the deal. Cause I think a lot of people, 
are, are kind of turned off even when they first are told about the band and it's like oh it's like this western black metal thing They're like oh that sounds dumb it sounds gimmicky and um thankfully i think a lot of those people if they do get a chance to hear it they're like oh this is like way way more real than i thought it would be you know and that's like that's that's how we approach it we want it to be like a, a real intentioned thing not not a like check this out we're gonna stick this and this together isn't that wild you know yeah yeah it's not like y'all are setting up like a makeshift saloon on stage and you know having gunfights <laughs> yeah yeah for sure <laughs> not, uh, not quite to that level yeah i mean that's uh i know that um you know there there's those kind of like folk metal comparisons and uh you know, as much as I dig Amon and Marth at times, uh, sometimes the Viking longboat on stage is a bit much. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, you know, like like I said before, I don't necessarily even dog on stuff like that because it is fun. Like sometimes people yeah. just want to go and like drink and be like, oh, check that shit out. And that's great. There's a, there's a place for that in the world. But that's just not us, you know, like uh, I leave that to, yeah, the, the Iron Maidens and Amon and Marths and, and whatnot to the world that can build a big old inflatable or whatever the hell like stage structure that's great but we're gonna just play guitar <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i think that your all sound kind of perfectly encapsulates the landscape of like the american west where it's like it's beautiful and inspiring but it's also very cold and unforgiving uh it's that that freedom that exists you know when you're out there in in the west and especially like in the old west it was just I think a lot of people don't comprehend like how lawless of a time period it was in that region of the country. Yeah, definitely. Um, no, I think that you, you hit the nail on the head there. Like, you know, we've always kind of drawn even from the early days of the band um, from, from the kind of landscapes and the, the natural um, feeling of the the place here in Colorado and, and in the West in general. Um, but yeah, as we kind of, honed in more on this like actual you know kind of period american western sort of sound um yeah it just made sense because it it's it is such a such a defined imagery you know that you can kind of channel through through the music too and and yeah there is a lot of things about it that are dark and unforgiving like you know from the landscape itself to either like the, the high mountains to the kind of desert plains or then yeah like the history of it and how how much violence and corruption and and kind of tragedy there is associated with it it, it really really lends well to uh to metal for sure yeah yeah i mean like just the the wilderness alone out there like i know that um <laughs> a lot of people have gotten super into camping and hiking in like the last uh i guess mm -hmm. decade or so but i think a lot of people still just don't really often think about the fact that the further out that you get into the wilderness, the easier it is to still get eaten or to have something happen yeah. where you're just stuck there, like injured. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. Uh, you know, I think kind of the whole outdoors world, it's great. It's like healthy for people to get out and connect to nature and, and exercise and all that. But, but yeah, I do agree that um, I think some people take it a little too lightly and um, yeah, it's still, you know, even even in a country as as populated as the U.S., like there's still vast stretches of land that are like basically untouched and, you know, live live by their own rules out there. Like so it's a uh, yeah, people people definitely don't don't always recognize kind of um, the power of wilderness and things like that. Yeah, I mean, like my uh, my running joke is that, uh, you know, if you connect to nature too hard, you eventually become part of the food chain again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, how many how many of those kind of cautionary tales do you see of like, oh, this person like lives with grizzly bears and all that, and then they always end up getting eaten or some shit? Because it's like, yeah, guess what? You're not. That's not how it works. And like, it you you might make it work for a minute, but at some point, you know, the 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 laws of the natural world will will come to call, and that's kind of your fault. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it just leaves the rest of us with an amusing documentary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But yeah, it's it's a very uh not not exactly a twist ending. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, with the uh the corruption and kind of lawlessness of the old west too, uh, I was thinking about this not too long ago, um, and it kind of ties into this like ongoing discourse that there's been on social media 
where everyone's like, ask the men in your life uh, how much they think about the Roman Empire. But it's like, I think about the Old West way more than the Roman Empire, because like we're not that many generations removed from a time where like half the people that you encountered in a day probably killed someone. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's it's interesting looking at the U.S. and like how deep and rich and complicated the history is for it being so relatively young, you know, in relation to other countries. And and yeah, like this stuff that seems like an ancient world that we dive into um, in the grand scheme of history is very recent. And there's still a lot of kind of traces of a lot of it in today's world. And yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah. Very, very wild time. And and yeah, I, I know what you're talking about with like the jokes about, yeah, the men in the Roman Empire and stuff. And there's there's some discourse that comes up with that in like the Old West, too, because so much of the like the Western films and stuff are so centered around, you know, kind of the ideas of like masculinity and like taking charge of your own world and, you know, like the outlaw kind of perspective and whatnot. And I think that's another thing that like needs to be more, um, you know, the, the kind of layers peeled back on it more to see actually, you know, what, what, what all this means and what actually did happen. And, and um, I, we, we take a lot of influence from film in the band. And, you know, I think when people think like Western movies, the first things that come to mind are probably your like fifties, largely black and white morality tales, you know, John Wayne movies, things like that. But there's so many more eras of Western film that, um, we're actually a lot more deconstructive and, and a lot more morally gray and um, kind of questioning of the the human aspects of it. And that's the type of stuff that we like the most because there is more than meets the eye, you know, to a lot of this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just uh, I think, too, a lot about the uh, the cartoons over the years that were set in the Old West where you've got like the pointy mustache guy who uh, ties people up and puts them on the train tracks. And it's like, how many times did that actually happen in real life? You know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many, uh, how many railroad deaths there were, but probably <laughs> some. And the, the idea definitely applies. Yeah. I mean, there's just, uh, there's, there's so much like, I, th- there was a thing that I thought about when I was in college, like maybe, 12 years ago now where I was joking with a friend in I want to say like 2009 or 2010 that it would it, it would be cool if like given the context of like the way that folk metal in Europe came about like especially in the Nordic countries where it was a reaction to um basically like Christianity coming in and taking over and like superseding all of their traditions like hundreds of years ago if there was like a similar thing where like here we had like native american black metal bands and like Mm -hmm. i just in the last few years found out that there actually are native american black metal bands on like some of the reservations definitely Uh, yeah there's actually a lot of a lot of good music coming coming from those um groups of people like uh you know obviously black parade has been like all the rage lately but um bands like pan american native front have been the ones that i've noticed for um a lot of years that are like absolutely doing that and you know in our own way in a in a totally different obviously cultural approach um we're doing something similar where it's like yeah you have your scandinavian black metal or folk metal or whatever bands that um, tap into their landscapes their history their mythology to kind of uh, and and the influence of the music itself to um you know their approach in, in making heavy music and for us being like fans of black metal and these things it's like we want to do that but it wouldn't make any sense to also go over the same kind of scandinavian tropes that don't apply to us whatsoever um so like kind of dipping into the history the landscape the lore and the music of the american west it's just like yeah it's kind of like you said like it it's a very sensible response to to that kind of world but um yeah there's a lot of great, great music coming out of um, people either of, you know, Indian Native American descent or like people actually on reservations um, that that I'm glad to see getting out there more because I think it's just like it is a new take on it. And there's a lot of great music there. Yeah, it's it's been really interesting just kind of seeing all of that get more exposure, too, because there's um, 
I feel like I just like didn't hear that much about any kind of things like that coming from like the reservation lands until the last few years, but mm -hmm. it was probably always there and it just didn't get as much coverage because the, you know, there weren't people like paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I would agree. And, and, you know, I just think like the, the landscape of music has changed where, um, you know, it's, it's a little easier to record stuff and get it out there in the, in the age of social media and band camp and things like that. So yeah, it is cool to see um, maybe parts of the world and even parts of the U.S. that like didn't really have access to a platform, you know, to get their music out. Um, that that has changed, and now we're getting to listen to all this cool stuff. Yeah. So tell me about the you know writing and recording process for American Gothic, because like some of the things that really stuck out to me as I was listening to it were like the way that the clean vocals are layered in that it almost sounds like it's kind of like it, it sounds like atmospheric like it's um i guess if, if we're talking about it as a comparison to like the landscape of the west it kind of feels like kind of like the sky elements of like you know a landscape kind of just like mixing into like this rocky horizon and you know creating this very vibrant but dark and grim kind of you know visual in the head uh that's awesome i i uh you know with the at least with the clean vocal specifically definitely hadn't really thought about it that way it was just like an element that we wanted to include that we've you know played around with on the last couple albums that we decided to kind of go full force with this time but that's that's really cool that it uh, brings that to mind um uh, because you know i think in writing the record, we do think very visually and conceptually. Um, and, for, you know, from the start of this process, like we knew what the album was going to be titled. We knew what the color scheme of it was going to look like in the physical form. And we kind of knew what concepts we were chasing after um, in the lyrics and in the music. So everything was kind of fashioned after that, for sure. Like it all had to conjure certain certain feeling and certain imagery. Um, and And yeah, we kind of you know, from, from the jump knew what we were going for and then uh, dove in from there and kind of made sure all of the individual pieces were, were there to serve the the greater whole of the album. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was an exciting process. Cause then, you know, once you dive in and like we have, I don't know, I just am always blown away by the, the, the people in my band and the people I get to play with and like the ideas that, end up being brought to the table and end up being like, you know, when we dive into a song, like the things that kind of pop up um, that people come up with and bring to it. It's just like a really uh, exciting, gratifying experience to watch it all um, come together, like from, from concept to actually, you know, being brought to life. Yeah. And uh, with a title like American Gothic that could really kind of like, I guess, sort of encapsulate your all's, um, you know, thematics and everything. Do you um, feel any pressure? Like once you had that set in stone that because of the title, like this had to be the definitive kind of like example of your all sound or, um, you know, does that in come a, into play any? Yeah, in a way. Yes. Um, you know, I think um, each album kind of centers around some like, not not concept album in the in the terms of like this is one story every song is a chapter in the story but you know they do center around certain concepts and so for for the world we were diving in with this one which is a little bit kind of you know um turn of the century or post turn of the century like after the westward expansion has basically been completed and you have the railroad stretching coast to coast and you have these kind of like bigger money industrial interests taking hold um and also then more thematically metaphorically we were kind of building around the concept of this being um like the funeral for the american dream like the in, in the last album it's kind of like the deconstruction of the west as an idea and interpretation through through myth and film and legend or whatever and at the end of the record of the last record there's kind of like these questions of like where is the dream where did it go and so from this one from the jump it's you know the dream is dead it may have never existed in the first place like this is the the cold um tragic reality of the world and of you know specifically this world and this view of the united states 
And so for that realm of concepts, we did want this to be a, a definitive statement, you know, like for this era of the band and that sort of things, we wanted to make the album that encapsulates all of that. Because when we, whenever a few years down the line, we get around to making another album, we'll probably, you know, be pointed in a different direction. It's all maybe coming from the same seed of an idea and the same lens of this kind of like Americana Western um, approach to making darker music. But, you know, we we kind of go for a certain concept, a certain world each time. And this one was meant to be the definitive statement of that that realm of things. Um, so, yeah, I think picking a title like that was was kind of purposeful in that way. Like it, it is very definitive sounding. Um, and, you know, we wanted to kind of set that standard from the start that like that's we need to make a fully fleshed out um vision of this this thing and make it make it the the one so that we don't we don't have to retread this ground in the future you know we will want to cover this now and do it right right now yeah yeah and with that uh overarching theme of you know the industrial revolution and how that was the death of that version of of the american dream and you know the death of that sort of the beginning of the death of that sort of lifestyle um, was it an intentional kind of juxtaposition to, um, I guess, sort of the sense that has been persistent in modern times where it's kind of like the unattainability of the American dream at this point, or was that more unintentional? Um, I think, you know, in, in terms of like a, a parallel and a connection to modern times, it's like, it's kind of unavoidable, right? Like, uh, you know, the the one great lesson of history is that it's doomed to repeat itself. Um, and, you know, humans are, are kind of seemingly set in these cycles of, you know, making the same mistakes and going down the same paths. And so, you know, when you're examining something, especially something as in the grand scheme of things recent as like 120 years ago, um, you know, there's always going to be so many glaring parallels to you know a lot of the the problems of existing today in the united states and in in society at large um so i i think we you know we never try to go too heavy-handed on the like metaphors for you know current affairs modern issues sort of things but um the parallels are always kind of there to be drawn anyway so that's something that's like you know kind of intentionally left for interpretation i think that makes a lot of sense too. Um, tell me more about the Denver scene and uh, you know how the band, I guess, sort of initially came together and how your sound evolved over time. Yeah, um, yeah, I think I, I spoke to some of that earlier in terms of like you know how we kind of um, how that kind of influence of a lot of the old, old Denver stuff, um, the kind of Gothic Americana woven hand, 16 horsepower stuff kind of came into play and we embraced that later on. But I mean, the band just came together, I think in a very, very kind of typical fashion of, um, four young dudes who were really into metal and really into playing and, and really wanting to like make something, um, to, you know, contribute back to the well we've drawn from our whole lives of like all this really cool shit all this really cool music um that had been so influential to us as fans as musicians as people um and so you know it was just a matter of like starting a band and wanting to do something and then over time you know this band was started when we were pretty young depending on how you look at it uh, myself and the original guitarist were kicking around ideas under this name as far back as like high school um but it actually became a band in like 2012 um but even then you know it's still very formative so i think you can kind of trace through listening through the albums kind of seeing a band that started and maybe it's a little easier at the the first record to like be like oh these guys were into this this and this we're trying to do that sort of thing um to you know now being this like fully developed sound of our own that you know is made up of whatever elements um but uh but yeah I think it's um, certain bands like start either because they, they, the members have been in other things and they've kind of learned what they want, or they just are there from the, the get go. Like certain bands will start right away with like 
you know, what they're there to do. And I think other bands we're, we're kind of in the other camp of like, you know, growing over time and like finding our sound and then embracing it. And then, uh, kind of trying to fully, fully flesh that out and figure out what that is and the best it can be. Um, and yeah, I think that's, uh, that's evident through our history. And I feel like the last like three albums, including this one, you know, are, are fully what the band is. Um, and this, album to this point is definitely you know the furthest ebb of of what we can be to this point yeah and um do you feel like in the last uh i guess few years or so that so there's like this period that i can remember where the like metal elitism had kind of reached a point where everyone just like hated clean singing and like everything had to be such and such to be true metal but it seems mm-hmm. like in the last like few years, especially, there's been a little bit more openness to other influences coming into metal than there might have been, um, you know, in the late 90s, mid 2000s, uh, mm-hmm. when that sort of stuff really kind of came to the forefront with different genres blending. But now it seems like there's a lot more openness to it and willingness to embrace it. Yeah, um, it it definitely seems that way. You know, I know there are still people out there that like their metal to be a certain way, and that's that's totally fine. Um, just like in terms of what we do, like we just don't really fucking care because at the end of the day, we're making the the music we want to make, and everybody in this band listens to all sorts of music. You know, we've all been metal hits since we were like twelve years old, thirteen years old, and like we take that seriously. But at the same time, you know, we're into american folk country and americana we're into like uh ambient music we're into synthesizer music we're into all sorts of other stuff so like um i you know it's just so limiting i think to be like well we can only ever do this though because that's what this band is and um i don't know you know i it's I'm, i'm glad to see that there's there's plenty of people out there who are also down with you know um a fresh take on something and it's fine that there are people who want things a certain way, but like at the end of the day, we don't care whether people like the music or not. We're making the music we want to make. Um, and then we are then grateful that, you know, there is an audience that is down to embrace it. Um, Cause for me, it's just like, life is just too short to make music that already exists. You know, and if, if, if you were um, being in a band to like play by X and X rules of like, what is black metal? What is this sort of thing? Then like, I don't know, that just sounds like a waste of fucking time when you could just listen to those records that do that for the rest of your life and they'll probably never get old that's the beauty of music because you can still enjoy this stuff but for for us if you're going to take the time to make something we want to make something new that we want to see in the world you know so that's that's really what it is and i'm just glad that yeah like you said that there is a kind of contingency out there that is uh, looking for 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 new stuff new ideas and like stuff that is done well um that takes an approach that hasn't been done before and i definitely fall into that camp as well i think a lot of the bands um i don't pay as much attention to new metal bands coming out as i used to but a lot of the stuff that does come out that really gets my attention and sticks with me is bands that are like you know typically harder to classify i guess yeah i mean that's one of my favorite things when i hear something new and i can't figure out how to explain like what exactly Mm -hmm. it is you know in just like a simple word exactly i think that's i think that's often a good sign you know like if it is good and it's like powerful and you're feeling something but you don't know how to describe it because i mean think about you know back before internet forums and all these other nerds like defined every aspect of what black metal was like these bands came out first and you know there wasn't all those rules and all those terms and people just heard it and they're like holy shit this is awesome i don't know how to describe it it's just cool and you know but now we're how whatever way you want to look at it 30 40 years into the existence of black metal so like maybe let's try to do something that also makes somebody feel like that you know yeah i mean like one of the things that used to annoy me during like the myspace days for example would be you know, you'd have bands that would just like message people looking for new followers and they'd promote themselves by saying like, we're the new Metallica or we're the new Pantera. And it's like, why not be the first you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's just some like, uh, either marketing shtick or just, yeah, trying too hard to, 
follow in the shoes of something you like where it's like yeah that's that's fine but you're only going to get so far if you're trying to build yourself into yeah this clone of this other thing you know like you probably probably be more beneficial to figure out what makes your sound your sound and focus on that yeah i think for especially for like a genre to really survive and continue thriving too like you have to try new things because otherwise new people aren't going to be interested in it definitely or the people who have listened to it will get bored of it you know where it's like we all have the bands that we love and the albums that we're already attached to that we're probably going to love forever but in terms of people putting you know new music out into the world i i have enough you know like black metal black metal that i like i'm not necessarily out there seeking something else to uh you know something else to scratch the itch of what i like about immortal or what i like about any of these bands or even in other realms you know like at the gates or something like that it's like i i have those records i don't need new ones um i'm looking for something else if anything um and and yeah i think that yeah kind of like you're saying that there needs to be people out there pushing it new directions because otherwise like there's just not appetite um i mean not that much some people are looking for great clones of x bands and that's fine but i think overall yeah for for the survival of a genre as you're saying yeah there's there's uh, much more appetite for like where what are new corners of this that haven't been explored and and, and things like that yeah, it's kind of like uh about a month ago i was listening to an interview with uh nurgle from behemoth and he was just like mm -hmm. yeah don't start a new black metal band it's been done already exactly yeah and if you are then you know black metal just like heavy metal was to begin with like you know it's now this very broad umbrella of things that be that can you know fit under there like i mean with wayfair for example like we use black metal as a genre tag because it's just easy like you know the genre tags existing is helpful for for description you know for like oh you haven't heard this it's kind of this and some of this and therefore if you hadn't heard the music that might help you give a reference point and so you know it's 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 useful in that way but people get way too hung up on the genre tag part of things where it's like you know we will to to put it into four words we'll say like black metal of the american west or whatever however, however many words that is five or I don't know. I'm not going to take the time to count them. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's not that we're approaching it being like, oh, it has to be all of these, you know, tenets of black metal then because we called it that. Like, we're just using this broad umbrella of black metal as a starting point because we like the spirit of it and we like certain stylings that definitely influence our writing. And, you know, it's it's more black metal than it is death metal or doom metal or something like that. But at the end of the day, we're not concerned with, like, being kind of like you're saying with the Nurgle um interview like being a black metal band and somebody being like oh well it says black metal but it doesn't do this or this or this it's like yeah i i don't care that's fine um you know like we we took that as a starting point and went a direction and you know it's we might put that on a, a tagline to give somebody a point of reference but um we're just not that concerned with how much of a black metal band we are at any time i guess yeah, and like just the way that you all describe yourselves too leaves enough room for you all to continue experimenting instead of having to do like albums by numbers. Cause like there's only, for example, so much ACDC that I can hear because every album after Back in Black is Back in Black Redux. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For sure. No, I mean, yeah, I, th I think uh, I, one of my hopes for the band is that we're we're cognizant of of that always that if we ever get to the point where we're covering ourselves like those bands end up doing you know that it's like okay unless we're making absurd amounts of money like acdc is so i can't blame them for still doing it then uh unless that's the case which it won't be because we're fucking playing cowboy black metal um <laughs> then then you know that's probably will be the time to hang it up um because yeah i i just the most fun part, you know, you you, okay, you don't start playing extreme metal to like make it huge. So like the reason we do it is because it's like it drives us. It's exciting to make new things and make music. And if ever we get to the point of like, OK, well, I don't really have any new ideas, but like we should try to make something like that thing we made 10 years ago. That just doesn't really hold any appeal. So hopefully it's a while till we get to that point. But when we do. Yeah. So we pay attention. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, like as as much as uh, people rag on a band like Metallica, for instance, whenever they try things that don't necessarily work, like at least they're still trying stuff and being interested in doing that. For sure, man. Um, no, we uh, Wayfair is kind of obsessed with Metallica. <laughs> we, we we talk <laughs> about them all the time, and we watch all the documentaries, and we'll like listen to all the records just just out of fascination of the you know trajectory of their career. But we honestly end up talking about that a lot, where it's like. Um, you know, I, I hate to say it. I'm just like, not, not a fan of this new Metallica album. And that's not for the typical reasons that people are like, Oh, it's not this. It's not that. It's just like, it just doesn't seem to be trying anything. Cause even something like St. Anger, which don't get me wrong, is a train wreck of a musical release, but like they were trying to do something. They were at least taking a swing, like you're saying. And I do respect that. Like, and, and, uh, yeah, we end up. <laughs> spending way too much of our time in this band talking about Metallica, but that'll be the kind of stuff we talk about where it's like the 72 seasons thing kind of seems like them, you know, just trying to emulate some of the sounds of their career. And it never really goes there. Like there's a lot of almost riffs on the album and like songs that could be something, but they just stretched it into like six, seven, eight minutes of almost doing something. And like that to me is like the most disappointing thing they could have done where it's like, I don't know, you listen to like Reload and it's stupid as hell, but it's like fun because they're doing this weird like half grunge biker guy rock band version of Metallica. And, you know, it doesn't need to be 75 fucking minutes long, but it's it's entertaining because they they took it somewhere. So I, I do agree where it's like you should be doing something. You know, I, all of my favorite bands, you know, Metallica is kind of an extreme example because they got so huge and set the mold and then went all these like just weird funny directions but a lot of my favorite bands that i do like all of the releases of their of their career um you know there is so much change you look at a band like enslaved that like they have gone through so many iterations but not not in any kind of chameleon way or like chasing any kind of trend way like they just keep pushing it to different places and i love that shit that's like really cool as a fan to you know be like oh there's however many like 14 or so enslaved albums, but they're all like worth your time because each one is doing something totally different. Yeah. Like I love the, uh, that period in like death metal and then in black metal later on where a lot of bands hit this sort of like death and roll or black and roll sound. It was was just like different than anything else that the other bands were doing. Yeah, definitely. I, uh, we, we've also talked about, uh, and one of, one of the other projects that like myself, Isaac and Jamie are in, circles around a lot of this this particular kind of evolution in the process but how somewhere in the 90s a lot of these like you know norwegian like black metal black metal bands decided that it had been done and then like all of a sudden they were doing like industrial electro black metal and like that shit's fucking awesome man like the the thorns album and like the satiricon rebel extravaganza bands like dodheim's garden stuff like what a cool thing to come out of the fact that people were like, okay, this has been done. We got to do something else. Um, and then you have this whole other kind of subgenre that's like a world in and of itself. I don't know. I think that shit's cool. Yeah. Like now you've got Satyricon doing the score for like a monk exhibit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it definitely ties in with his modern, you know, winery art gallery persona guy. So, you know, go for it. Why not? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so here's a good question for you: Can metal bands wear shorts on the cover of Decibel magazine? <laughs> uh, I don't give a fuck. I think it's hilarious that people do give a fuck. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I, just of all the things to trip about, like you know, most of the bands I play in like to like go go headlong into a certain aesthetic so you know at this point we're full pearl slap uh, pearl snap button downs collar tips boots the whole nine because that's how we choose to present the band because you know we like bands like fields of the Nef- nephilim or even like growing up and listening to Timmy borgier and cradle of filth and stuff bands that like you know everything about them is representative of, the, of their sound and that's how we choose to do it that being said like everyone should do it how they choose to do it and I actually think it's more absurd if those guys were to like, you know, put on like different band shirts and like a, a rattier pair of jeans or whatever, because that's what they thought people want them to look like, you know, like if this is how they dress and they don't, you know, they don't want to do a specific thing with their band, 
But who fucking cares? Like, do you like the album or not? Like, I I don't know. If you're worried about what dude from Two Mold is is wearing, you know, on his legs, then that's your problem. I don't know. Just listen to music, man. Yeah, no, it uh, it cracked me up because it's like um, out of all of the subgenres of metal, like death metal and grindcore are especially the ones where I'm just like, those are bands of guys that just look like regular dudes on the street and they just look like regular dudes on the street. Yeah, they look how they look. And that's that's mine. It doesn't <laughs> change his ability to play the guitar, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's... <laughs> It's, I don't know, it's so weird that it's like that. And then like that the extreme example, it's kind of like, um, you know, do you really care what your doctor ultimately looks like if you're in the emergency room and you're about to die and they're the only one that can save you? Like, yeah. who cares? Be a little bit more worried about what they do than how yeah. they're dressed. <laughs> like, if you like the music, who gives a shit? <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. It's, I mean, whatever yeah <laughs> but, you know that's that's a very uh 2020s internet age discussion although i guess really you know people have flipped out about aesthetic things since the dawn of time um with with music and whatever else so it's just that uh nowadays people can be more annoying about it because they have social media as a platform yeah i mean it um also kind of reminds me not to bring up Metallica again, but of when they cut their hair and everyone lost Always their shit. Did. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and you know, in that in that instance, like it it was a little bit more tied to a change in their sound. So like I get where people are coming from, but also like we were talking, it's like I'm glad that Metallica did something and it, and you know like you should always do like Opeth is a great example of like I'm a long time you know 20 year Opeth fan um and I'm not a huge fan of the last few records like their switch over to being kind of a 70s prog band I like it to a point but it you know it doesn't doesn't do the thing for me like the old Opeth albums did but I don't hate on them for doing it because it's clearly what they wanted to do and like they made like 10 metal albums and then decided to do this great you know i would rather you do that than make half-assed versions of your old albums and so that same sort of thing applies to the metallica thing so sure people were bitching then because they cut their hair and changed their sound it's like well i don't think they want to be thrash metal guys anymore you know they're millionaires they're also just living weird crazy lives and they want to like make this type of music that's their prerogative like you're not metallica you don't get to tell them what to do and uh i, I don't know you know if you want to keep your hair long great keep it long i'm i'm sorry that you know, Kirk Hammett's wearing eyeliner and James Heffield is dressed as a leather daddy sheriff now. That's just how it is. <laughs> if you don't like it, don't buy it. You know, like I, uh, as much as I love and justice for all, I feel like there was only so many times that they could create like crazy time signature changes before it just got hmm. really exhausting to have to play it every night too. Yeah, exactly. No, I think they're like, we want to, you know, they released the black album, which was like one foot in one foot out of that world. And then when that shit took off, they're like, oh, let's just enter Sandman all the time. Like, let's just write one or two big rock riffs and write it out for a song. Okay, great. That's what they want to do. Go for it. I, I don't know. It's weird when people take this, like, ownership of the things they like and be like, oh, you can't. Oh, I can't believe you did this. It's like, what do you mean? They're the band. They can do whatever the fuck they want. It has nothing to do with you. If you don't like it, don't buy it. Obviously, it's like I get it. I've been disappointed by things that I like changing, but at the end of the day, you got to understand that it's made by people, and people are going to make the choices they make, and it has nothing to do with you at the end of the day. Yeah, like I'd rather have like an artist make music that they're actually going to want to play every night instead of something that they're like, "Why do I got to play this shit again?" Right, for sure. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like you know it's such a era of nostalgia. Now you'll see a lot of these festivals have like X band playing this album all the way through, which is very cool as a fan, you know, to see like a legendary album, especially like if, you know, if you're like me or you and you're in your early thirties and you weren't around when some iconic, you know, late eighties death metal album came out and it's cool to have a chance to go see it live. But I feel like the interviews with the bands are like half and half, like either they're like, Oh, this is fun to like revisit this older stuff. Or they're like, I hate the shit. I was over the shit 
25 years ago and that's why we stopped playing it but you know somebody's paying us thirty thousand dollars to do it so here we are and it, it's funny to kind of get that perspective because to the fans they're like this is the ultimate album and sometimes to the bands they're like not to us you know like we did this and we covered this ground for years and we're over it and uh yeah it's it's kind of interesting to see that way yeah i mean i remember there being like a typo negative interview before peter Steele died where they were just like how many encores do we have to play black number one in our lifetime right right it's like the yeah, song it starts never to dies. be like <laughs> meaningless to the the players which yeah and then that that becomes the question like who is the music for is it for the musician or for the audience and i don't know that's a whole philosophical debate yeah like, like one of the coolest times that i ever saw nine inch nails was a set where they didn't play closer and i you yeah. know got to the end of it and i was just like oh they didn't play that tonight and i didn't care that they didn't play it yeah yeah especially like i think you'll you'll get a, a more energized performance from a band if they're yeah if they're playing the stuff that they actually still feel like doing and so yeah i i respect that as well you know I mean, it's like oh i wanted to hear this but as long as you've got a good show then what what is there to complain about yeah well uh i've taken up about an hour of your time today shane uh thanks again for taking the time to do this is there anything else that uh you want people to know about uh, no, man, I appreciate you having me on. I'm always down to talk about Load Era Metallica with anybody. Uh, and no, it was, it was a good time. And yeah, thanks for the interest in the record. We're stoked to put it out and then kind of get out there again and bring this thing out to stages. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, Load is probably my favorite uh, modern Metallica album, you know, post uh, 80s. So always happy to talk about that some more again sometime too. But uh <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah, everyone check out uh, American Gothic out October 27th. And uh, thanks again, Shane. Yeah, appreciate you having me on, man. Take care. My rock, you, my rock.